Closer to God. Welcome, Tori. How are you? I'm doing well. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, this morning. Thank you for the invitation. Well, we're so grateful to have you on. Um, it's a special day um, in our liturgical Christian uh, calendar. This is the time of uh, year when we're celebrating a Holy Week uh, as we are heading up into uh, Easter on this Sunday. And today mm-hmm. is Maundy Thursday. Maundy Thursday. Is, is that a term that you use um, in your faith tradition? Um, I, I mean, I didn't even grow up Episcopalian, and, and I had never even heard of Maundy Thursday until I was much older. Is yeah. that something that y'all uh, think that we, bandy about? No, we. I didn't grow up with that term. Um, my family and I now attend a Presbyterian church, yeah. and so I've heard that term a lot over the last few years. Yeah. We grew up knowing this as the day of service, yes. you know, the day where yes. he washed the disciples' feet, the day in yes. which he struggled in the Garden of Gethsemane alone, yeah. you know, but it didn't have an official Monday, Thursday term to it. Yeah, and, you know, I was uh, doing my official Wikipedia and online research last night to kind of dig deeper into the uh etymology behind uh okay, look at you I, yeah well you know i gotta put that english uh, degree to good use <laughs> somehow right. um i was looking at the the reasoning behind why it's called maundy thursday and and i guess there are a couple different schools of thought some uh, think that it's uh, the root word is mandate or the great commandment where mm. God, Jesus at the Last Supper, you know, he charged his disciples to um, love others and to serve them. So mandate, that's a commandment, Mondi. And mm. then there's there's this other kind of uh, deep track uh, interpretation that Mondi um, has something to do with basket weaving. I, I don't I don't know. I don't I, apparently the people on Wikipedia think that that is not that's kind of universally thrown down. but um, you know maybe the people who are listening can chime in um, and let us know what they think about the etymology of the word uh, um, Mondi. But you know at the end of the day, what we know about this day in uh, Holy Week is that it's a time where, like you said, Jesus um, called together his disciples for his last meal, and that's where they broke bread, that's mm-hmm. where they drank the wine, and um, and then he asked them to come and pray with him in the Garden of Gethsemane because he knew what was coming next. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, you know, it was a part of my reading this morning for devotion, uh, six yeah. days of Holy Week in the Bible app. And yeah. There were a couple of things that stood out to me, one of which was uh, this supper that will never end. You yeah, know, Jesus tells yeah. them that like uh, this will be the last time we drink wine together mm-hmm. until that great feast when I bring all of all of the believers together yeah. again. That that picture of him painting a vision of the future, yeah. knowing that their faith was about to be challenged in 24 hours, watching him yeah. be crucified. Yeah, um, yeah. And then. The second of that is just the struggle of yeah. Jesus of Nazareth in the garden, right? Yeah, that, yeah. That transparency and vulnerability where in my faith growing up, I was taught a lot about, you know, you don't question God. Yeah, you, you got to be strong and you have to be totally sure. Right. And it was just powerful to watch him struggle and mm. for him to take those conversations back to the God of heaven. 
and uh, to see that there are some places that we have to walk and go that even our closest friends don't have the strength to go with us. But right. It's, right. It's our Could calling. you not stay awake with me? Right. Could you not stay awake with me? Right. A lot of our churches um, here in Memphis um, and, you know, all over the world uh, are going to be commemorating um, Maundy Thursday uh, this evening with a really solemn prayer service um, where not only is there, you know, the the regular um, order of worship, but there's also going to be a portion of time where there's feet washing. Mm. And those are times when the you know leadership, the member of the clergy, will wash the feet of those who are coming to worship. And and it's kind of, it's such a crazy role reversal. Yeah, it is. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples yeah. the day before his crucifixion, and then he asked them to stay awake with him overnight to pray with him. And of course, we know that they that some of them couldn't; they fell asleep. Absolutely. It is a powerful picture, you're right, of uh, just servant leadership. Yeah. You know? It's, yeah. Uh, and especially in the age of a rock star pastor. Right? Yes. Most yes. of us attend churches that have hundreds of members. Uh, what a picture it would be to see uh, Pastor Rufus at Hope, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, yeah. Come down and with a towel to ungird himself and to, yeah. uh, and to begin to wash the feet of his entire staff like that. That picture is very a very humbling picture, especially mm-hmm. in a society where we like to put those who are spiritual on a pedestal. Jesus yeah, came yeah. down low, you know. That's yes, yes. What does servant leadership mean to you? Because you are a leader. I appreciate that. Um, I do my very best to yeah. be a leader, um, as imperfect as I know that I am. Um, I would say that servant leadership to me is just that. It's a selfless act of giving without expectation or receiving mm-hmm. anything in return. Yeah. It's uh, sometimes doing the action that no one else will do as yeah. simply as picking up a trash can you see falling outside yeah. of the campus mm-hmm. or being willing to uh, cut a tree down or yeah. could be serving leadership can be showing the way in a nature that is humble yeah. and it's not filled with uh, uh, entitlement. Yeah. You know, of I shouldn't be doing this because I'm – the executive director exactly CEO, but more or less i should be doing this because of my role as the ceo or executive director i yeah. should be willing to um give all of my gifts and talents yeah. uh, back to the king and allow yes. him to uh pu- push him out as he sees yeah you know? um scott morris who is the you know founder and ceo of of church health which is you know just down the hallway from where we're sitting here right now at wyxr um he, you know, is is in a pretty high position, and but I remember hearing him say once that if, you know, if if there's an empty toilet paper roll, he's gonna he's gonna refill it. Hmm. He's gonna refill it, mm-hmm. and and that speaks a lot to how, you know, who who sees that? Well, the f- people who you are leading see it. And, and it heralds back to that original person who made, uh, who became incarnate. Hmm. And I mean, how, how, God came and he became a person. Yeah. Uh, how is that? It, it, it's, it's quite mind blowing. Absolutely. You think of uh, the Philippians picture yeah. that Paul paints of, you know, here's Jesus having all power, being mm. with God from the beginning and him being willing to put his, uh, universal uh, resume to mm. the side, his yeah. deity to the side, uh, t- in order to serve and to fulfill a mission of uh, humbling, being spat at, being yeah, um, being bruised for our iniquities, and yet here's the the person who's been with God from the beginning. Yes, um, yes, it's, it's just such a picture of humility, you know. Well, um, from one person to another, I, I'm really delighted to start my uh, the triidium of mm. uh holy week with you mm. and uh and i'm Thank really you. delighted to be able to chat with you a little bit more Likewise. throughout the morning um happy monday thursday happy monday thursday to you i and am your listeners yes um we're gonna play some music okay. that came out of for the kingdom okay so let's listen let's go ftk mm. 
Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The rebirth. Another chance. Yahweh, you're my superhero. I'm saying glory to your name, Lord. Glory, glory, glory to your name. Not here to pontificate with you today. It's not been seven days. My vehicle took 16 shots by my hop. I got a bullet in my neck. It's my blue check. You got angels watching over thee. Correct. Holy Spirit filling me like gas cans. This cold world got me feeling like real life Jabari. Only my body would have died. My spirit would have been alive. Worshiping my king either way. Glory to his name. It's my plight, it's my aim. With this verse and with my life, I'm connected to heaven through my brother Jesus Christ. Miracle got me feeling like New Testament believers. No death required for us. He already did that through his son Jesus. You're the king of peace. Take a brain in me. You're the change I seek. You fill my deepest need. So to you I cling. Admiring your good ways I'll teach my children to say Glory to you. I feel like Jacob as he wrestled with the past Left with a bruise on his hip As a reminder of his shift Bullet in my neck, it's a gift I call it my rebirth God picked me up Dusted me off Reminded me again that I'm a son of a king Yahweh's love for each one of us is deep the story of his grace, I'm amazed. Unmerited favor, I should have died. But to Yahweh's eyes, he never sees defeat. Like David in Psalms 23, I was in a dark valley. And Yahweh was there with me. That's got me turned like Sunday service. All my days, I'll go crazy saying, glory, glory, glory to your name. produce this song glory tell to me, his name tell you know? me about some of the voices that we heard on that track uh so you heard obviously my voice uh you heard the voice of uh let's see four of my 10 children uh you heard my two twin girls that are four years old yeah uh, my son jace who is seven yeah and then my son jairus who's a junior here at crosstown um and then a young lady uh, who is a sophomore at Briarcrest Christian who came and uh, volunteered her time to do what was just worship for me. It was therapy for me coming yeah, out of yeah. the, uh, the shooting. And so, yeah, you you told me off air that you recorded that track like two weeks, maybe two weeks yeah. after you were 
you, I mean, we all are miracles, but oh. you really are a miracle. Tell our listeners about what happened to you last December. It's last yeah, December, right? It was yeah. December 18th of 2021. My vehicle received 16 shots while in South Memphis, um, out doing some Christmas shopping. Yeah. And uh, one of those bullets, uh, one of the seven bullets that were aimed at my head, mm. uh, one came through the windshield and struck me in the face. And mm. that bullet now resides in my neck. Yeah. And, uh, and yet five hours later, long story short, I was uh, being released from the hospital with the uh, words from the doctors and the nurses that you are the luckiest man alive. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, I disagree with them, you know, that it wasn't luck, but that it just showed, you know, the God of heaven's love and mercy, mm. you know. Um, and mm. so out of that, for me, I had a another level of appreciation for that love, right? It was yeah. like uh, my own resurrection experience, so to speak, mm-hmm. of or walking on water experience that uh, after being shot, I was able to drive myself to the hospital um, to Methodist South and yeah. got some of the care I need and was then ambulance to Regional One uh, where, again, I was able to get the care that I needed. And uh, by the time the doctors got to see me, they said that my body, uh, the tissue around where the bullet hit, mm-hmm. uh, my body had already began to uh, cover the bullet and protect it from uh any harm it could do me and that it would be better to leave the bullet in yeah. than mm-hmm. to take the bullet out. And so uh, I am indeed Yahweh's walking miracle. Yeah. And it's given me a new level of appreciation for life. I I mean, that's a saying a lot because your life is one that's it seems to be really rich and fulfilling and to find uh, in such a catastrophic frightening moment in your life to find God in the middle of that, especially considering all the wonderful things that are going Mm -hmm. with your family and with your ministry at for the kingdom. I mean, can I just, I, I, I want to have a little piece of that kind of, (laughs) that kind of piece. My wife was a huge part of that though. I I would be remiss. like she showed up at the hospital and about an hour and a half in, I finally got to see her and uh, you could tell she wanted to jump Mm. on that gurney with me, but she kept telling me to keep my eyes open because God wasn't done with me. And before that moment I was struggling, like, am I, Mm. you know, I had blood flowing from my face like a faucet and I had no answers. I wasn't sure if I was living or dying. Her words in that moment uh, increased my faith mm. to believe that this wasn't it for me, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I want more and more of that every morning, right? Of just yeah. that, to feel that love, experience that love at a deeper level that isn't uh, just a ritual, but it's the God of heaven is real and alive and will meet us where we are. Yeah. So, so we're the reason that we're here talking today is to talk about um, the work that you're doing at for the kingdom with youth and, you know, creating a place where they're safe and where um, they can explore the richness of God's kingdom. Um, And, and, and I feel like a lot of the questions that I want to discuss with you um, are around the theme of how can we be, um, modeling the kind of behavior and the kind of wisdom that we want to impart to young people in the world. And, but I, I feel like you just being you, I, it, that might, it, it answers the question. <laughs> I, I, but, I but, appreciate that. but, but let's start at the very beginning. Okay. Cause we're, we, we sort of are starting back from a few months ago sure. with this, this, you know, this incredible event in your life. Tell me about little, little, uh, little Tori. Little Tori. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, well, I came from a broken family, uh, which, you know, unfortunately is the norm today. Yeah. Um, I met my parents divorced when I was two years old. Um, and I grew up kind of going back and forth mm-hmm. in between the two of them, uh, seeing the fights uh, between step parents and real parents. And, uh, at a young age, I began to reach out to the world, mm. you know, looking for love. And um, so when I went to school, I was a rebel without a cause. Yeah. You know, I was uh, the class clown. I was the kid always getting in trouble. Um, in my sophomore year of high school, I was actually expelled from school. 
Um, my sophomore year of high school, I was actually expelled from school um, and was left with nowhere to go to school in Georgia. Yeah. And uh, I was hopeless. And yeah. I grew up going to church every Sunday. Uh, but it was one of those experiences where the pastor was super cool and loving. Mm, mm. Um, but the church itself was a uh, uh, outward appearance. You know, yeah. Like, hey, mm-hmm. you've got to dress the right way. You've got to say the right things. And so as a young person, I learned to maneuver. I yeah. learned the right lingo. I learned how to uh, debate the things of God. And mm-hmm. yet I wasn't close to him at all. Yeah. Um, it wasn't until I was 18, uh, living in Detroit, Michigan, right outside of Detroit, Michigan, mm. rather, uh, with my father who had uh, just overcome drugs and a mm-hmm. crack cocaine addiction um, and had gotten his life back together. And I was kind of on my final hoorah of yeah, a place yeah. to stay. And uh, um, I passed out on the side of a highway um, yeah. from alcohol and drugs at a party um, in high school. And uh, I could hear uh, Yahweh saying to me, boy, this is your last time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, a few weeks later, I went to then what was called Promise Keepers, which is yeah. a convention. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. you've heard of it. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And uh, it was there that um, I met Christ. You yeah. Know, I'd heard of him, and I had walked an aisle, said a prayer prior to then yeah. when I was eight years old, and I was always God curious growing up. I yeah. always had lots of God questions, and um, and yet my faith hadn't fully connected with the fact that he was all I needed. Yeah, and he had always it, been there. And that he was always there, yeah. And exactly. you were like, oh, there you are. There you are. You're here yeah. to rescue yeah. me. I do yeah, need to yeah. be rescued. And you don't need me to change first. You just mm. need me to surrender. And yes. so I walked down uh, at that Detroit Silver Dome where the Detroit Lions play. Yeah. And uh, thousands of men were down there. And I was a youngin. You know, mm. all the counselors were helping someone else. And for the first time in my life, you know, outside of praying for him to help me on a test or something yeah, like yeah, last yeah. minute that I hadn't studied for. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, uh, I prayed to God and I asked him to come into my life and for him to uh, give me a chance. And from there, I um, my life was different. Yeah. Um, How did, what, what's the line uh, that you walked to finally find yourself in Memphis and doing this wonderful work of For the Kingdom. Yeah, so I um, I started doing ministry at 18, um, yeah. uh, right after I preached my first sermon, right before my 19th birthday. Yeah. And uh, I began to go to Bible college, and Bible college created an opportunity uh, where I got a three-year uh, scholarship to Carver Bible College yeah. to play basketball and yeah. to pay for my education. And it was there that I began to meet uh, black and brown men who had mm. made the journey and matriculated through some of the best seminaries in the country and had come back to Atlanta to uh, join Carver Bible College. And mm. I began to learn Greek and Hebrew while I was uh, in Bible college. And um, I began to learn how to study the scriptures. And my pastor, who had been with me since my adolescence, began to walk with me. Mm. And so I had this firm foundation and uh, I began to walk with God. I uh, graduated from college, moved to Dallas, Texas, yeah. and um, I somewhat became a prodigal again. There were yeah. some things in my faith that I was still questioning um, and didn't really know how to live out a, a, few, a full, pure life. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I walked away from ministry um, yeah. at 24, and uh, I got a job in the oil and gas industry and yeah. began to do investments. And um, when the hurricane happened in Haiti, and I think yeah. that was 2011, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the Lord used that to grab my heart. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to help, and I began to ask God to give me another chance to serve him, that the money I was making and the cars I was driving weren't fulfilling. And, yeah. um, and so at that moment, um, I began to work with a couple organizations, and that led me to uh, starting an, a ministry that worked yeah. with kids and used basketball in Atlanta, mm-hmm. right outside of Atlanta called Alpharetta, Georgia. And uh, it was called Interman Academy. Mm -hmm. And we began to train and develop young athletes and help young men and young women find uh, college scholarships. But allowed us to use the game of basketball as a vehicle, right? Similar to me, like I had grown up in church, but when I really met my Savior, I Uh wasn't in church, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely, Um, definitely. And and so that avenue allowed me to rub shoulders with thousands of young people and Mm. help hundreds get college scholarships and it was from there that um, I found out about a group called the Leadership Foundation. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's one here locally mm-hmm. called the Memphis Leadership Foundation, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, led by a great man by the name of Larry Lloyd. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was at a party in D.C. one weekend um, at a board party, and uh, um, a young woman asked me, she said, uh, 
uh, they had an organization here in Memphis and uh, their executive director had just resigned and she said it was a place created for kids that was 100 acres and it had yeah. zip lines and I'm like I yep. grabbed my phone immediately like what there's a place created just for kids yeah mm -hmm. um, and I started researching it couldn't find anything and uh, we began to talk and yeah. during that time I actually had an allergic reaction to something we were eating over dinner and uh, you've seen the movie Hitch before it's well, been Will a while, Smith, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But his face starts swelling Yeah, up. yeah, yeah. Um, and so my, my face started swelling, and so I had to leave the dinner, but we exchanged numbers. And uh, I went back to my hotel room and uh, took a couple of Benadryl and yeah. went to sleep. Next morning I woke up and I told my wife about this place that we couldn't find anything on. And uh, after I finished my presentations at the, uh, at the board retreat I was at, um, I found my wife had sent me a picture of a Google image of For the Kingdom. Yeah. And uh, a few weeks later, uh, they invited us down for me to be to do some consulting for them. Yeah. This was November of 2019, the week before yeah. Thanksgiving. It was yeah. bitter cold. Yeah. And uh, I had never I rem about I remember that. Actually, I remember November of 2019. Okay. Because it was, uh, I remember it was one of the last uh, sort of hurrahs before our world got turned upside down that holiday season yeah and I do remember it being very cold yeah yeah, yeah very yeah. much so and um and so uh I came down and uh I fell in love I yeah could hear the voice of God if, if you can fall in love with Memphis um in the winter especially uh areas that are really uh, there are trees everywhere it can it can get kind of depressing but if you can fall in love it's like okay this is this God, is you must be in it yeah yeah you're here you're here yeah <laughs> So I left here and I went to Africa for two weeks and it gave me time just to really pray and, mm. and begin to ask the Lord for a sign. Like, And every time I prayed about For the Kingdom in Memphis, the Lord began to fill my journal yeah. with a vision for what For the Kingdom could become and who we could be. And at the time, yeah. I had been traveling with the NBA and junior NBA all around the country. And I could hear the Lord saying, from Memphis, you'll be able to touch the world. Yes. And um, he's right. Memphis is are. great. Yeah, Memphis <laughs> has been a, a wonderful place. My, my family and I are glad we chose 901 for sure. Yeah. Um, I, something you just said really um, pops out at me. And it's that, you know, God is, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they do amazing things. And it's not just in church. That part. I, I you know, I think that as a kid, I always thought, well, I have to, I have to go to church. And off air, we were talking about how uh, I was, uh, you know, I have a 10 year old at home and I'm like, okay, well, it's Holy Week and you have to choose a um, extracurricular um, service mm -hmm. uh, at church that I need you to go to. Um, and I remember as a kid being like, okay, church, got to go to church, got to go to church. But God, we can worship him can worship him playing basketball we can mm -hmm. worship him making music mm -hmm. we can worship him in so many different ways and we can serve him in every single thing that we do mm -hmm. and that's something that you are doing by working with young people at for the kingdom um what are you and and specifically it, it's it's a place that's built for children and for young people exactly when you survey um, the youth that For the Kingdom is serving, and as a father, how, what sort of rises to the top of your list of priorities and the challenges that they're facing as we move into this new chapter of crossing our fingers, knocking on wood, post-pandemic life? And this time when, you know, we are, our, our young people are really moving into a time that uh, they're reckoning with a lot of the things they learned about us as a society over the last couple of years mm. and the way that we treat each other. Yeah, I would say that there's, that's a, that's a, that's a, uh, I mean, we could have a series. Oh, right, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I would say the top, uh, maybe top three. Mm. Uh, would be one that um, children need to be seen. Yeah. You know, mm. often uh, growing up kids are, are told to to kind of be quiet and to don't be seen or heard, mm -hmm. right? It's the best way for you to maneuver. Um, 
I've seen that lesson taught over and over. Yeah. Um, and I think it's validated through scripture, right? Like, yeah. uh, I see the picture and when I see my family, I mean, I have a family of 10, eight at home, eight children still at home. And, um, often there's, there's somebody who's always getting lost in the mix. Yeah. Someone mm. who's going unseen sometimes as they get older, uh, they don't want you to see them. They don't want you to see their struggle. Um, it's because of the habits in which they get used to out in the world. Yeah. So when I say kids need more than anything. They need a safe space. Yeah. Right. And mm-hmm. I think home has to be the place where you can be yourself. If you need yes. to scream, if you need to yeah. shout, if you need to let it out, home mm-hmm. has to be a place where you are fully accepted and fully loved. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's first and foremost. Uh, most the home I grew up in, I was fully accepted and fully loved, mm-hmm. regardless of who I was, and that didn't come without discipline and whoopings. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah. But I was fully accepted and fully loved, and I would say uh, Jesus did that. His disciples brought yes. people to him, and they, Let and they the were like, "Little children, the, come unto yeah, me. Like, Get the little kids out of here. You need to be dealing with the adult ministry." Yeah. And he's like, "Exactly, like you said. Let the children come to me. Let them see me and know that I am real and that." Uh, their issues right now are just as real. And I would say second to that would be um, being very, very intentional about our faith and sharing Mm -hmm. our faith, allowing our children to see us having devotion, allow them to see us worship God, allow them to see us broken. Um, You know, instead of us painting this picture for them that we have it together. And I would say that even in community, um, you know, it's the same. It's when something goes wrong in a community like Raleigh, which, you know, crime is high, poverty mm. is high, broken families are high right now. And we pray and believe God that, that won't always be the case. But that is our current reality. Mm. We believe not addressing those issues are what's causing them to continue. Right. Yeah. Like when someone gets shot and we don't stop and we don't pause to address that life has been lost. Right. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. It, it begins to beget more of the same situations. And, and then it I'll, helps you. And, and I think that it also sort of normalizes that this is the way things are with hey, kids. It's just, it's, yeah, just deal with it. Yeah. It's like this is just, and it's part of our identity. This Absolutely. is this. And, and I, I hope that, you know, I hope that when my kid sees something that's wrong, uh, or she sees an injustice, or she has somebody dole that out to her. She can say, "Well, I am a child of God, and I don't, and I don't accept that." Yeah. I, I hope that it's never normalized, and yeah. I, I don't know. That's that's something that I, as a parent, think about a lot. Like, what can we be doing to stop normalizing hurt and pain to our children? When when Yahweh is a a God of healing mm-hmm. um, and does not want to put a band-aid on our wounds, yeah. but he wants to heal. He wants to root it he out. He wants to root it out and heal us. Um, and so I think introducing a God like that, and I think what we've learned the most through the pandemic and everything is uh, when we got here, those first that first year and a half, we were doing a lot just to kind of learn yeah. the community and listen yeah, and find it, out what the I needs I mean, it were. sounds like you were onboarding right when the world got shut down essentially we had a full year and then as we were going into year two march of 2020 obviously the world began to so you're you're now actually seeing memphis as it as it was absolutely and you're getting to meet people and know people we were that first year we had our head down um just to make what we had work we wanted to be first class hospitality and so Mm. we've got cabins and zip lines and we wanted to make sure that our campus was prepared to be able to host yeah Uh, going into year two we were all about getting into the community and what we realized our biggest prayer at the time was lord teach us how to love raleigh teach us how to love memphis because you can't love someone you don't know and then the pandemic happened when the pandemic hit, we realized that a lot of our programming was just like, and this is no disrespect to no, church. No, no, no. But it was like church. It was like, if you didn't come to us, yes. you didn't know we were there. Right, you know? right. Um, when the pandemic happened and we heard the Spirit of God say, feed the block, what it did for us is that it got us off our campus and it got us mm-hmm. into multiple apartment complexes and neighborhoods every day, five days a week, serving meals, playing games. Yeah. And what I realized then was that, again, the gospel, the good news of Jesus has to be mobile. It has Exa- to be yeah. willing to go into the tough places. Um, we were going into neighborhoods that 
uh, were known for violence. Yes. And we were setting up tents and speakers and um, and we were giving out meals. And what we found were kids coming to us in droves. Yeah. For a, a deli sandwich. Exactly. Know? It's like we think about the life of Jesus. We've been focusing on him a lot uh, over the last, you know, several weeks in the season of Lent. And he was moving. He was mendicant. He was... Um, feeding people he was performing miracles he was healing he wasn't saying hey here i am catch me next week yeah. in galilee <laughs> yeah like no i mean that, that yeah whenever he did make an appearance people would show up Absolutely. but he was mobile and he was bringing people what they needed where they were at yeah and and i think oh man i hope i don't get in trouble for saying this but i think that we've made our places our our brick and mortars i think we've kind of made them holy cows absolutely like almost you hate to say it but almost like idols yeah yeah like unless you're coming to this place yeah. coming you know, to or coming to our program or coming to our program at this place mm -hmm. that's the way you meet god right when yeah. i was growing up i can remember my parents going to evangelism classes and then i can remember going to church on wednesday them dropping me off and saying i'll be back in an hour and a half because them and the team would be going out to go do street ministry, to go knock on doors. And in our faith, that's still kind of an anomaly. Yeah. We don't really find our faith on the go. And when we do, it's, again, we're trying to formalize it into a program. Oh, that's the parachurch ministry's yeah. job, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. instead of it being, being that Matthew 28, 19 through 20, it being in order for us to reach young people, we must go to their schools and be with them, Yeah, right? We must hear their voices. A lot of times what we do um, is that we make plans, we build buildings, we build programs yes. without ever sitting down and saying, hey, what do you need? What is what do you want from us? Where are you hurting? How can we help you heal? We think we know already. And a lot of times the devil exists in those assumptions. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Christ sits with us. He walks with us. He 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 dwells with us around a, a, a table mm -hmm. so that he can see who's the deceiver. Who's faithful? Yeah. Who talks too much? Right? He's yeah, able, yeah. And he's only able to see that by relationship, not just by the fact he's all knowing, mm -hmm. you know? And with us not having, you know, uh, omniscience and yeah. being able to know all things, it behooves us to really be able to get down um, with young people in order to allow them to speak. And when they do speak, take the things that they're saying to us to heart. Yes. And allow those thoughts to shape the way we maneuver and make plans for them, but yeah. not make plans without them. Right. And then bring it to them and think, oh, we tried, but they weren't listening. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, let's go to um, a musical track real quick. This is another song that has come out of For the Kingdom. Yeah. Yahweh's walking miracle here. It's a blessing to be back in the booth. Got my boy Sir Walker with me. Yes, sir. MKJ with me. Blue Jay with me. Yeah. I have a dream that I am king. And like Martin, I'm starting a movement. Like Tim Allen, my home first. I'm improving. Like James, I'm schooling. And I promise, oh, I promise. Everybody eat, keep your money in your pocket. Everybody eat, keep your money in your pocket. I'm um, Yahweh's walking miracle. They tried to put seven shots in my temple, huh? It's simple. Like Kirk, I put them first. I'm God's property. You can't off me. He loved me. That's part of the dream that we'll all wake up to the reality that Yahweh loves us. You need to come home to that love. You can pontificate about all you heard and read in a book. I can tell you what I know. That's that Yahweh's love is real. Yeah. MKJ FTK. Yeah. Let's continue talking about that love. You know what I'm talking about? Big dreams, you feel me? Yeah. 1015, now, man. 
Yeah, yeah, Memphis, Tennessee, growing up, I was hopeless. Now I'm on a mission, big dreams like Joseph. Rest and never sleep on my grizzly like Jaren. Building up community, no longer tearing down. We on our Nehemiah, dwelling in togetherness, lifting our people higher. I keep high doing business in harmony with Messiah. Big with action, that old talk, we retire with the fire. Got that heat like Tyler, my King Jesus, his will we desire. Yeah. multi-talented i appreciate it i, I mean, appreciate that that's very kind of you to say right before we went to the break we were talking about how you know we need uh to be ministering to children and youth where they are mm-hmm. where they are and and i mean as i listen to the tracks and the music that y'all are creating and the programs that y'all are um initiating at for the kingdom i see you doing that um And we're talking a little bit about um, what the church can be doing to serve youth better. And we talked a little bit about that before the break. But do you see, where do you see hope? And where do you see success and churches and ministries that are getting it right? Yeah, I would say that where I see hope is um, is anytime I see collective uh, work happening together. when I see organizations, uh, for instance, coming into Raleigh, like the Literacy mm. Mid South, yeah. that are not coming in with their cape on, but they're coming in, talking to those who are already on the ground, finding ways to build mm-hmm. bridges together. Yeah, that's actually how we got connected. Absolutely. That's how the diocese um, and For the Kingdom got connected. Literacy Mid South is developing an app. Um, that is going to be, it's a literacy app that will be used um, to help young people um, um, sort of bridge between uh, their teachers and their um, parents in um, achieving academic excellence. Mm-hmm. And y'all are one of the key players that uh, that piece of technology is going to benefit. Absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, we've got nine schools in our, our neighborhood, public schools, Shelby County schools, or excuse me, Memphis Shelby County schools mm-hmm. that we've adopted. And in those schools, the literacy rates um, have been low. Uh, where I find hope is in the fact that each one of them, due to the relationships with uh, our, our relationship with Literacy Mid-South and others, we've been able to create new libraries. Yeah, uh, um, yeah. And I think that I find hope there, one, because whenever you're able to start changing the subconscious thoughts of children, right, mm-hmm. um, then you're able to really uh, change their conscious thoughts. If a kid can't read or doesn't have access yeah. to books at their fingertips, i.e. their schools, um, it's hard for them to dream outside of the neighborhood they're in, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But books allow you to discover a world that doesn't exist. So I find hope there. I find hope in the practicality of what literacy brings. Um, I also find hope, again, in the partnerships uh, of like Shelby County being open. Uh, They pursued us um, about a year and a half ago uh, in the adoption of our schools to do more. Um, Mm -hmm. And in that part of what we asked them for were the learning gardens and the greenhouses that exist in those schools. Um, we believe that uh, the love of Jesus can be seen in our community by helping in childhood hunger. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we see that the meals we serve every day, the thousands of meals we serve a week, yeah. we see those as being just plugging the dam. But the work of churches, Fellowship Memphis and Hope Church yeah. and 
others, you know, um, Embassy of Faith right there in our neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. The work that they're doing to not just partner with us, but to build bridges in our community. Give me hope. Yeah. We have more churches in our neighborhood than we do have gas stations. Yeah, right? that 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 sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that that's true of Memphis. Absolutely. It is, this is a very uh, uh, church rich city. Absolutely. Absolutely. They say that the South is the Bible Belt and yeah. that Memphis may be the buckle. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like. So that, that speaks highly of, you know, the religious part that's here. Mm-hmm. But what I can see our churches, especially since the pandemic, kind of moving out of what we were just talking yes. about that. Hey, you've got to come to my place. Yes. But actually yes. seeking us out to come to our community yes. to help serve. I see um, people moving to Raleigh to be a part of the change that's needed in mm-hmm. our community. Yeah. The other thing that gives me hope is that when we came, we said, hey, anywhere we can hire young, we yeah. want to hire young. Good. And yeah. I mean, like even right here in the radio station with me today, I've got two of the most gifted young people that I've ever met. Yeah. And, and Nick and Jarrell. Jarrell has to be the most gifted marketing coordinator I've ever met under the age of 30. Hands down. Nick. I know, I'm, I'm shocked that he's under 30. He's he's <laughs> Resourceful, going gangbusters. He's yeah. Community oriented. He's humble. He's teachable. He's creative. Yeah. He's passionate. Right. And that's what would go against the grain of what people say about our young people. Yeah. Right, today. Uh, they would say that they're entitled only. They're looking for a handout. I would say the same for Nick. I mean, someone who is willing to walk away from a career as a firefighter to do ministry full time. Yeah, you yeah. Know, like uh, relationships like that give me hope that uh, that the change that we've been believing God for is is here. And already. I think that you know, I, you you strike a chord when you talk about Jarrell and marketing. That's something that. Uh, you know, ministry. I am a marketer. I am a communicator, <laughs> okay. and that's uh, something that we have at the church, or at least the Episcopal Church, has not done well. Hmm. Before the pandemic, um, we have twenty nine faith communities, Episcopal faith communities, here in our diocese of West Tennessee. Before uh, the pandemic, none of our churches were live streaming. Wow. None of them. Wow. And I mean, that go- goes to say that there was not a online ministry. And of course, today it's very different. We had to learn real fast how to uh, do it adequately, adequately, and we did it under duress. But now I think that we're beginning to see uh, and recalibrate. Well, it wasn't just, um, you know, sick, um, elderly or shut-ins who needed those live stream ministries um, or live stream services it it is people of all age groups Absolutely. but especially young people who um, are raising up and growing up in a time where a TikTok could speak to them that just part. as much as a um, a prayer meeting on a Wednesday night Absolutely, and in fact it's probably more so more so and that's that's to your point, right? Like going to where young people are mm-hmm. instead of trying to make them fit into a box that we've made holy. Yeah. Right. The only thing that's holy about the box is that Jesus is there. Yes. Right. Yes. Like, but he also exists in the triangle or in the TikTok, or he can use absolutely anything, right? Yeah. He could use a demon possessed man like Legion, mm. right? And the yeah. healing of him in order to bring glory to his name. Yeah. In the same way, uh, he can use absolutely any form, right, or function in order to bring glory, right? Yeah, he can do it on our podcast. Oh, no, absolutely. I see what you did there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're we're having church right now. This is absolutely. church right now. Absolutely. And here we sit in the middle of Crosstown Concourse, mm-hmm. right? And the gospel message is going forward. And as you said, church is happening yeah. right now. Um, and we're not in a... Uh, in, in a place that many would deem holy, right? Um, and so I would say in that same way, that's part of where our thoughts have been. Uh, what is the kingdom of God sound? It's the reason why we're yeah. into the music is because there's a rhythm to music. There's a beat. There's something that draws people of all races and creeds in when you talk music and beats. And so we, we ask ourselves, how can we take the messages that we know need to be heard mm. and how can we push them out in creative ways in which people will will have an appetite for them. Um, although we can't stand, we uh, we partner and help sponsor, it's called She Got Game. It's a mm-hmm. semi-pro women's league 
maybe the best in the country, definitely yeah. in the Mid South. And uh, we have a chance to do commentating a few, yeah. every you know every few weeks. I love that. Um, but they bring in I some of the that. best DJs in the city. And like the music you're playing, we can give it to the DJ and say, hey, you mind playing this for us? And although if they set up a platform and gave me 10, 15 minutes to speak about Christ, most people will probably go to the concession stand. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but you can hear it. When we put the music on and you look around, people are, they're getting a spiritual vitamin without even knowing it. Yeah. And, and to me, that's where I find hope is that God, we often look for God to bring the change in. When essentially the change is always there, but we have to have more of a focus on the fact that Jesus is enough. Yes. We want to yes. add something to it. But if we if we can get back to the basic foundation, like what this week represents for us in our mm-hmm, faith, mm-hmm. that Jesus Christ has done the hard work. Yes. He gave his life for the sins of all of humanity. If we can learn to to rest in that and take that message to the world, he's he's guaranteed us that he will draw all men to himself. Yeah. He's done the work. The work is finished. It is finished. And we're just, but we've got that mandate. Absolutely. And we're going to keep working at it. Yes, we are. Tori, it has been such a delight to have you on the show today. Um, we've talked a little bit about this, but at on each of our shows, we like to close with this question. What's giving you hope? What's giving you hope today? Um, I would say a few things. Um, I would say, obviously, my hope in Christ. Um, you know, prior to being shot, I've been, as I said, I've been in ministry since 18. Obviously, I took a couple of breaks as a prodigal mm-hmm. running from him. Um, Our, we're all prodigals. I agree. I agree. All, I him. mean. But you know how we do. Sometimes we, yeah. uh, we measure sin. Yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're mm-hmm. into that, so they're worse. Oh than yeah, them. yeah. Um, but like, uh, I've been giving my life away and shouting from the rooftops about His love and His kindness. And there was something in me that um, felt empty, felt alone, felt unseen, unloved. And I would say, what gives me hope today? I mean, I know it may sound weird, but it's the bullet in my neck. Yeah, the bullet in my neck is a constant reminder every day of just how detailed his love is. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say the other thing that gives me hope is that the change that we need uh, can be found from within. Yeah. Right. Um, And so and the final hope I have is that the God of heaven is alive and well and that he's willing to come down and meet with us and commune with us. Um, That's what gives me hope. You know, And I know that maybe sounds very traditional or uh unreal to some but i would as i've told my children if if there's something that you need pray and ask god about it and be quiet Mm -hmm. trust him ask him i guarantee that he will show for you because he does not turn his a quiet ear uh to the prayer of somebody who is calling to him in desperation yes yes well thank you so much for sharing that Thank you for the invitation. Um, this has been Faithfully Memphis um, for Maundy Thursday of 2022. I um, am so appreciative that uh, you, Tori, and your staff have spent some time with us. I'm especially thankful for all of our listeners for spending some time with us um, this morning on the show. Uh This is Faithfully Memphis. We are a podcast and radio program produced by the Episcopal Diocese of Mm. West Tennessee. Um, You can learn more about us and find a faith community that is loving, accepting, and wants to meet you where you are on our website, which you can find at edwtn.org. Um, If you've listened to the show today and it speaks to you, um, I encourage you to share it with a friend who may not have heard it. Uh, You can find us on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify, all the usual suspects. Wherever you get your podcasts, you can find us. Um, And if you feel so led, I would really appreciate it if uh, you would like us and leave us a positive review on Apple Podcasts that really helps us broaden our net and uh, get more people uh, listening to the good news that we're sharing on the show every week. Um, Again, I'm Emily Austin for the Episcopal Diocese of West Tennessee. And until next time, stay safe 
and stay positive.